Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. So, the Series X and the PS5 have been out for well over a year now, and I have been fortunate enough to get my hands on both of them. Shout out to my mom, who found the PS5 at a Belk, which is a clothing store that I didn't know even sells electronics, so... Regardless, I want to take some time to sit down and talk to all of you guys about what I think about them in this super timely and not at all late video. <laughs> so, let's get into it. So let me preface this by saying, I think that both of these consoles are absolutely fantastic, right? No matter which one you get, you are going to have an amazing generation of video games. Regardless of what anybody anywhere else is saying, both of these systems are fantastic. However, in this video I am going to come down a lot more heavily positive on the side of Xbox. Just wanted to get that out there so that I'm not catching any PlayStation fans in the audience off guard. It's just that when I think about the things that matter to me personally in gaming, Xbox comes out ahead in about 80% of those categories. And I just wanted to make sure that people were setting their expectations accordingly so that they're not getting like halfway through this video and then getting really mad that I don't like something about the PlayStation. Okay, so just bear with it and maybe you'll agree with some of the points that I make, even if you don't agree with my overall conclusion. So with all of that out of the way, let's talk about what is probably the least important aspect of these consoles, although the first one that you'll notice, which is how they look, right? The design of the consoles. And for the Xbox, it's a pretty standard affair, right? It's a very clean and classic black box. There's, there's not a whole lot to say about it. I... I personally really like the way it looks. It's just this this standard black box that's going to fit in with everything else that's in your in your entertainment system or in your room or wherever you're putting it. So it, it's not going to be an eyesore. And it has this really cool effect where the, the vent on top, the inside of the holes that are drilled for it, uh, is green. So when you walk past it, it has this kind of fun optical illusion effect where it looks like it's it's glowing from inside, which is really, really cool. Um, really, honestly, the, the only negative that, I've, that I have about the way the Series X looks is that if you choose to lay it down horizontally, which you can do, it's super easy, um, although probably not recommended, because the, the side that would be the bottom if it was standing up is a little more open than I would like. You can, you can see pretty clearly into it, um, and it's just got that circular base right in the middle, so it's a little ugly on that side. Um, but other than that, I think it's a very classic, very good-looking console. The PS5, on the other hand, <laughs> is very different, and for some people, that's going to be a good thing. You know, if you're one of those people who you were watching Drake and Josh as a kid, and you saw the, the game sphere or whatever that he had, and, and you were like, that's what I want, that's video games, then this might be the thing for you, you know, it's it's definitely different, I would say it's kind of ugly, like, it's for sure like a memeably ugly design, you know, I'm sure that closer to the launch of this thing, you know, I, I wasn't the only person who saw it, and saw all the memes where it was like, oh, that looks like Kaiba from Yu-Gi-Oh, or that looks like the Eye of Sauron, like, like, it's, it's very much a design that is going to be hit and miss with a lot of people, and for me, it's a miss. Um, but the thing that irritates me the most about the design of the PlayStation 5 is that somehow, a team of engineers who have been building not just video game consoles, but also TVs and all kinds of hardware for years and years and years, have invented a box that cannot stand up vertically or lay down horizontally without the use of an additional stand that has to be screwed onto it. And it's not a big deal, right? It's super easy to do, and probably once you have it set up, you're not going to be switching between the two, so it's, it's like a once-and-done situation. But it is a feat of engineering to create something that cannot stand in any position. <laughs> So let's talk about the power next, right? And I don't want to get into all the nitty-gritties and all the numbers and all the different specs and stuff because that's just 
for one, not my area of expertise, and two, really boring. Um, so let's just let's just leave it at the fact that this is another category in which the Xbox is very clearly the winner over the PlayStation, right? In almost every single spec and every single SKU, the Series X is more powerful and more capable than the PlayStation 5. It even has entire extra tools and, and features built into it at the silica level that the PlayStation 5 just doesn't have at all. Meaning that the Xbox Series X is going to be not only more powerful and more capable than the PlayStation 5, but also more future-proof than the PlayStation 5. In fact, the only spec in which the PlayStation 5 outperforms Series X is in terms of the SSD, right? The solid-state drive. And even that is kind of debatable, because while the PlayStation 5's SSD is significantly faster, it is also significantly smaller. <laughs> So it's going to come down to personal preference of whether you prefer your games to have shorter load times or if you want to be able to have more games or bigger games installed on your console at the same time. Me personally, I don't really care. I could go either way on it, but that's just sort of the fact of the matter. And I know that it's it's earlier in the generation, you we were seeing a lot of games where the PlayStation 5 version would outperform the Series X version. And that's for the same reason, <laughs> it, it's going to sound weird, but the reason that PlayStation 5 was outperforming Xbox at the beginning of the generation is kind of the same reason why Xbox is going to outperform them for the rest of the generation. Xbox, to get those extra tools and features built into the Silica, they had to wait for them to be developed and come out, right? And while they were waiting for that, PlayStation was able to start producing their consoles and their dev kits and get them out to the developers earlier, meaning that the devs had more time to optimize the games for that system. And so that's why a lot of the launch titles that were cross-platform we saw performing better on PlayStation, but already, just a year in, and it didn't even take that long, it was like six months in, we have already seen that switch over to where now there are a ton of games that are running significantly better on the Series X. You know, there are some that run at 4K on the Series X but only do 1080 on the PlayStation 5. And there's a, a lot of games that will run at 120 frames on the Series X but will only run at 60 uh, or even less on the PlayStation 5. So it's a pretty significant gap. And that gap is only going to continue to grow and grow as the devs become more comfortable with all of those added tools and, and features on the Series X. Um, at least until we do a mid-gen reset, which with COVID, who knows how long out that's going to be. So, the Series X is just the more powerful system. It was a long way to say it, but the fact of the matter is, it's more powerful. And on top of that, it has been my personal experience that my PlayStation 5 is significantly louder than my Series X. I turn the Series X on and it's the little boop and then I'm just playing games. And if I walk all the way up to it, I can kind of hear the fan, but when I'm back sitting in my chair, it is silent. The PlayStation 5, it is a very different story. I can hear that thing the entire time it is on. It's not loud, it's not distracting, and when I have my headphones on, it may as well not be happening. But it is a, a very clear difference. And especially when I first unboxed my PlayStation 5, it, it gave me a pretty bad first impression is, if you don't know, the game Astro's, Astro's Playroom, I think, yes, Astro's Playroom is preloaded onto the PlayStation 5, all of them. So you don't even have to install it, it's just already on there and you can immediately start playing it the second that the game, or that the console is plugged in. And so that's what I was doing while I was installing Miles Morales, which is the PlayStation 5 that I, a game that I was most excited for, even though it was also playable on PS4, but I don't, that doesn't matter, <laughs> right? So I'm playing Astros and installing Miles Morales, and for one, the fan got extremely loud to the point where my roommate actually came into the room and was like, what is that? Uh, and the game actually, at one point, even started stuttering and then froze while it was installing Miles Morales. And I've been looking around and this is not an uncommon thing. Apparently a lot of people have had that same problem, which is not great because over on my Series X, I will constantly be playing one game while I'm installing another and I have never run into this problem. I've never even heard the fan kick up, right? 
and so it's really weird. I haven't had it happen again on my PlayStation 5, so I don't know if it was just like a one-time thing for some reason, but I also haven't really installed a lot of things on my PlayStation because I don't spend as much time on it. So, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Um, but then we also have to look at other extenuating circumstances, like... Um, there's a lot of YouTubers, like Matty Plays and a couple of others, who have reported that their PlayStation 5s have actually started chewing up the discs that they're putting into it. I'll try to find a picture for it, but I don't know how long ago Matty tweeted this. But if you leave a disc in your PS5 for a very long time, like, you know, a couple of weeks to a month, there have been instances in which people are pulling discs out and having them almost have a serrated edge to them, which is very concerning. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you, you also have to take into account that not only is the PlayStation 5 at launch a less powerful system than the Series X was, but they've already had an update where they made the heatsink significantly smaller. It's like 30% smaller than it was at launch. The version that I have has a larger and more capable heatsink than ones that are on the shelf right now. So if my console is having problems where the fan is kicking up and it's freezing while I'm trying to install something else, the newer ones are going to probably have that problem significantly more often than even me, right? So it's a worrying situation. Now let's talk about what is going to turn out to be a much longer conversation than I think you probably came to this video expecting, which is the controllers. On the Xbox side of things, again, much like the actual design of the box, very minor changes, very little things to talk about. It's, it is it is the Xbox One controller, which was already pretty good, and just improved in very small ways, right? It's They added a share button, which doesn't really do anything for me. I'm not sharing stuff, so I don't really care about it. It's neat, I guess, for people who want to do that. Not a thing I care about. Uh, the D-pad is a little bit nicer. Like, it's, uh, they've added the, the one from, like, the Elite Controller that's the full circle. It's, it's a lot more clicky, which the noise of it can maybe be a little annoying, um, but you kind of get over it. Um, the texture on the grips and on the triggers feels really nice, right? It's that thing where it just makes it feel more quality, like, more polished. And on top of that, it also weighs a little bit more, so it just feels more like a piece of hardware. Like, it feels like it's worth the amount of money that it costs, which is a good thing because I distinctly remember in like the 360 generation, just how light they were and how like you would kind of, if you like squeeze too tight, they would creak and it was, it was awful. And I'm glad we've moved well past that. Um, I also like, and I know a lot of people don't, but I like that on the Xbox controller, you can swap out the battery. Having an integrated battery sounds like a good idea at the time, and in the short term, it absolutely is, right? Because being able to just plug the thing in and charge it that way is really easy. But here's the thing. When you go and you buy a Series X, just buy the plug-and-play kit. It's like $15 or $20, right? And then you have the exact same power that the, that the, that the PlayStation controllers have, where you can just plug it in and charge it. You can use basically any USB-C charger, and it's going to do it. You can use... Probably your phone charger is that, you know, it's super duper easy. And on top of that, if the battery starts to go out, which they will after a time, you can just take that out, throw it away and get a new battery for like 20 bucks. And then you get to keep your controller. Your controller stays perfectly fine, which on the DualShock 4 and the, on the DualSense, which we're going to talk about later, that's not the case. If the battery goes out in that thing, you are getting an entire new, what, $80 controller. So, I don't, I don't like that. I like knowing that if something goes wrong, I can replace pieces of it instead of the entire thing, right? And speaking of things that I don't like about the PlayStation 5 controller, this is going to probably be my most controversial section of this video because from what I've seen, a lot of people really, really love the DualSense controller. And... I am here to say that I love that people are enjoying things, but me personally, I think I hate this controller. Genuinely, I think it's one of the worst controllers I have held in my hands since the Wii U, which I guess was not that long ago. 
but still it's it's not a good controller um and i think a lot of that is because it kind of forgets that it has to be a controller and just is trying to stick so many gimmicks into this thing that are so pointless okay right so let's let's do a rundown there's the microphone and the speaker which the speaker was already in there from the P- from the ps4 but now they've added a microphone as well um, the speaker was already um, a bad idea that didn't really affect me before because you'll be playing a game and then your controller just starts making noises. And me, when I have my headphones on, which is how I play basically every PlayStation game that I play because the sound quality is significantly better. If you can play games with headphones, I highly recommend it because it's just it's going to sound better and you're going to be more immersed. And for a lot of the really great PlayStation exclusive games, that's a huge benefit. Um, so it's a feature that if you're fully enjoying it, you're not even going to notice, but if you aren't wearing headphones, it's just going to be kind of annoying. Like my experience with the speaker on the, on the PS4 controller is that (laughs) I didn't know it was doing it, but I was playing Death Stranding before I moved out of my parents' house. And when you're playing that game, the, the, the baby BB, when it starts crying, the crying comes through the controller. (laughs) And I didn't know that because I was wearing headphones, but my mom came into the room and was like, why is there a baby crying? And I had to then try desperately to explain like what BB is and like all this whole mess of what Kojima, like it was a long conversation and I was, it, it didn't work out. So it's just kind of an annoying feature. And then they've doubled down on this annoying pointless feature by adding the microphone. And so <laughs> what this means is that this little hole here, you can now speak into this for, like, party chat. Now, you might notice that this hole is right between the thumbsticks and all the buttons, where all the noise from the controller come from. So you'll drop into, like, a Fortnite lobby or a Warzone lobby or whatever, and you're just hearing, like, all this clicking noise. Like, this is what you're hearing the entire time, right? Because... A lot of games, if they sense a microphone, because they're not used to there being a microphone just on the controller all the time, they'll automatically kick your microphone to being on. Like, it'll just be a hot mic. And people don't know that. (laughs) So the people with the PlayStation 5, all you're hearing is, like, room audio, heavy breathing, and... Right? The whole time. It's super annoying. And on top of that, the people who do know that the microphone is there and they try to use the microphone on the controller, it's going to be one of two things. Either they're going to be holding it down here, out of camera shot, but like all the way down here, right? Because this is how you play games. And at that point, the audio sounds really distant and really bad. Or they're going to hold down the the share button on it because a lot of people switch to push to talk on it, which is a lot better. And if you're not doing that, please do that. Um, But if you do that and then they hold it up to their mouth and it sounds like you're at a McDonald's (laughs) drive-thru, Because they will hold it way too close. And it's like... And it's like, oh, come on. Like, it's it's awful. It it is awful in every single use case. I have never run into somebody on a PlayStation 5 multiplayer game who was using the controller microphone and it didn't sound terrible. And another fun addition to having that microphone is that on the PS4, when you got a trophy, it would take a screenshot, which was already kind of stupid because you were taking up space for a, a picture that I'm probably never going to look at, right? But that's fine because, like, a picture is such a small amount of data and you can go and delete it if you want. Um, on the PlayStation 5, it's not just a picture. By default, it's set to a video. <laughs> and it also, by default, uses the microphone on your controller to record your audio. So if you go... <laughs> And listen to one of the and watch one of the videos from when you got a trophy on your PlayStation 5, you're just gonna hear you heavy breathing, clickety clacking on the buttons, and your room audio. It's I I don't understand it. I immediately turned that off because I I I there is no scenario in which I'm going to want to have 500 three second videos of me breathing into my microphone. <laughs> like I just don't get it. Okay, it's. It's just such a strange choice, okay? And then, speaking of carryover things like the speaker, it still has the touchpad, and I don't necessarily hate the touchpad, 
you know, in the few instances in which games actually use it, I think that they use it in an interesting way. Um, like, specifically in Astro's Playroom, you can, like, you, the first thing that it does is it kind of gives you, like, a tutorial of all the different features on it, and one of the things is you can, like, sign, and you can tell, like, it's really sensitive. You could honestly, like, sign your name on it in a game, potentially, and it would work. Like, it, it is a, a good piece of technology. The problem is, it's not used. <laughs> Like, ever. It was on the controller for the entire PlayStation 4 generation, and you can probably count on your fingers how many games actually used it, and even fewer fingers how many actually used it well. Like, in most cases, in my experience, the touchpad just becomes like a really big select button, so it's like you open your map with it, or whatever. Um, because where the select button should be is now the share button, which took a very long time for me to get used to, I'll be honest. Um, because I guess I'm just not that smart. Um, but regardless, it's, it's just another feature that I am fairly confident by the end of this generation, it's gonna be exactly the same as last generation, where nobody is gonna use it. Like, no third-party title is gonna really use the touchpad, and if it's like last generation, most of the first-party titles aren't gonna do it either, so I don't understand the point of it. Um, but there are two new features, or gimmicks, um, and one of them is very interesting, and I'm, and I'm curious to see maybe they can fine-tune it better than it is right now and make it a cool thing, because right now it's not, um, and that is the haptic feedback. So, haptic feedback is a really cool idea. It's this, instead of just having, like, vibration, like, there's basically rumble packs in old controllers, and they'll have a couple of different settings, where it'll be, like, high, medium, low, and, like, maybe a couple of different steps between that. Um, and, like, I think the previous Xbox controller also added ones in the triggers to do a similar thing. And this is kind of that to the next level. So it just vibrates basically across the entire controller so that you can feel motion or you can feel sort of a more directional sense of where the vibrations are coming from. And that's on the surface, a really interesting technology, a very, uh, it's a thing that could help you become more immersed. And when I was reading all of the, the descriptions of people who were playing the, with the controller before launch, like, you know, your IGNs and your kind of funnies and all them, and they were really hyping this feature up. And I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. And then I got my hands on it and it's not. Like, I'm sorry to be the one to have to have to tell you this. It's not as cool as people are saying it is. It's really, really not. Like, those guys who are saying, oh man, Returnal is so good because you can feel the rain in the controller. You can't. You cannot feel the rain in the controller. That is not a thing. All it means is that your controller is going to be constantly vibrating the entire time you are in the rain. You're not gonna feel like individual raindrops or something. Like, I don't even know how you would feel the rain in a controller, but I can tell you you don't, because I've played Returnal and you don't. Um, so, it, it just... I'm sure that in future games, when people get more used to the te technology, like I said, it'll become a feature that's more cool. But as of right now, it's just really annoying. Like when I was playing Astro's Playroom, they, I guess, really, really wanted to show off that feature. And so it, every single action that you did, every single thing that you did, used it in some way. And your controller would just constantly vibrate, never stop. And so by the end, because I played that game more or less in one sitting, because I was really excited to have gotten my PlayStation 5, and it's not that long of a game. And by the t time I was done with that game, my hands were starting to, like, hurt. Because <laughs> the vibration had, like, made them numb and then, like, pushed beyond that point. Um, and it just, like, it hurt and it was really deeply uncomfortable so the last couple of stages on astro's playroom i had to turn it off i just turned the feature off entirely because it was more subtractive than additive and that's not something that you want obviously right and then speaking of things that ended up becoming more annoying than they were positive my most hated feature about this thing is the adaptive triggers. And a lot of people are very positive on it. You know, we were hearing a lot of talk before the console came out about like, you can hear, feel the tension in the bowstring. And I'm here to tell you, that's a lie. You totally can't, that's not a thing. And I don't know, Horizon comes out in like three days. So I guess that would be the one where you would feel it, but there's also a bow in Astro's Playroom and you could definitely not feel the tension in that bow. Regardless, my point is, it's not fun 
unlike unlike the haptic feedback, it's also not something I can see being particularly immersive in a fun way, right? It just makes it feel like the controller is fighting you. Like, I was playing Ratchet and Clank, and every single gun in that game has an alternate fire mode. So you pull the controller or the trigger half to, halfway, and then you hit, like, a tension point, uh, and that will either aim or do, like, a primary fire, and then you do pull it all the way past this, this point, and it clicks, and it'll do the alternate fire and or, you know, actually shoot, depending on the gun. They were different. Um, and on the surface, that's an interesting idea. The problem is that every single time I pushed past that point, it felt like I was breaking my controller. And because that tension point was pretty strong, and if you play that game for long enough, you're, you're doing that same motion over and over again, it's like a finger workout. And so, like, by the time I was done with Ratchet and Clank, it felt like it was giving me carpal tunnel. Like, it, it was genuinely hurting my my trigger fingers to continue to pull like i had to switch to my second to my middle finger to pull the trigger at, at, by the end of the game because it was just like this is because it felt to me like it was doing damage to my hands <laughs> which is something that i use constantly for work both in terms of playing games and writing about games and i also you know work on the computer for a living now so it wasn't something that i wanted to like have be a problem right um and so, I can pretty much guarantee, at some point, I'm going to push past that that trigger point, and I'm just going to break the controller. Like, I am in constant fear that that's going to happen. And, and beyond that, I've actually had multiple viewers of, of my channel reach out to me and say that they cannot pull the triggers past that point at all, right? Um, because they have some kind of dystrophy or other disability that makes it so that they just don't have the level of strength in their hands that is required to do that thing and so it makes it so that that is a feature that is just completely useless to them they have to turn it off or they can't they can't play the game right and that sucks and and that's on my end right I, i've heard that from multiple of my viewers and my channel is pretty small like i think right now we're at like 260 subscribers which i'm really thankful for and and i love you all thank you um but when you compare that to like the people who would have been giving feedback on this to PlayStation or to any of these developers making those games, like you know that they have to have also heard the same thing. Like they know that this is a problem. So I don't know why they thought that this feature was a good idea. It hurts. It's not <laughs> it's not immersive and there are people who cannot use it. It it irritates me so much that they decided to put this into the controller. It, it, when it was very clearly not a good idea. And on top of... So, I think I've talked for like 10 minutes about just the gimmicks on this controller. None of which I think, at the current time that I'm recording this, are additive to the games. But also on top of that, and I think partially as a result of putting so much money into the gimmicks of the controller, there's a lot of problems with the controller itself. It's changed its shape a little bit which I prefer. I think the shape of it is a lot nicer. It kind of mirrors the Xbox controller in a way. Um, and so the, the, the grips are feel nicer. Um, but it feels like it's a cheaper material than the Xbox controller. And I wonder if that is because there's so much money put into the, the gimmicks of the controller that they couldn't put the same amount of money into the actual material of it. Because that's genuinely what it feels like. Like, it does feel like if I twist this thing, I could probably break it with my bare hands. And I am not a particularly strong person. Um, also the power button is extremely sensitive. When I started sitting down to film this video, I accidentally brushed the power button and you don't have to hold it to turn the entire system on. So it turned the console on and I had to turn on the TV, go over to the input for the PlayStation and turn the PlayStation off. And then it was a whole thing. Like it's so easy to accidentally turn this controller and therefore the entire system on. And that's also really annoying. I already said how you can't replace the battery, meaning if that thing goes bad, you're buying an entirely new $80 controller that I do not think is worth that price. And on top of that, people are already reporting that this controller has drift issues, like the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons. This controller is a mess. I love my PlayStation 5, genuinely. I think the games are great, I think the power is great, I think it's a really, really good system. The fact that I cannot play on it with any controller other than this is the singular like most frustrating thing about this system and I I, I just 
I cannot enjoy this controller. Let's switch gears to something that is more positive for the PlayStation. Let's talk about the features of the consoles, and the first of which is achievements versus trophies. Trophies are so much better. Like, it's night and day. It's literally night and day. I am not, I've never really been an achievement hunter, and I don't necessarily super duper care about trophies, but getting a platinum trophy is so much nicer than getting every achievement in an Xbox game. There's not even a word for getting every achievement in an Xbox game. Like, do you just, is it called, do you call it like 1K-ing it or like 100%-ing it? Like, I don't know. Getting a platinum trophy feels so much better. And, and just the way it's organized, the way that you can look and see like, how many platinum trophies do I have? Which games do I have that in? And you can see like, these are the games that I actually completed like to their full list. It's it's so much nicer. And, and then on top of that, the the Xbox achievements, a lot of their games, they put the achievements into the multiplayer section of things, and that's never a good idea. Stop doing multiplayer achievements. If I have to rely on other people in a random match-made lobby to do a very specific thing so that I can get this achievement, then I'm never going to get it. Full stop. It's just not going to happen, and I'm not going to try to get it. I'm just going to immediately rule it off and not even attempt it. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I don't care, right? And that's, I don't think, what you were trying to do with achievements, right? You were trying to create something that I would want to do, and you didn't do that. And then on top of that also, like, when, when you get a PlayStation game, right, it, at launch it'll have all of, its, all of its trophies, and then you'll complete it and you'll get the platinum. And then if a DLC comes out, the achievements for it, or the trophies for it, rather, are separate. They're in like a separate tab underneath it, and then you can get all of those individually. And I don't think there's a platinum trophy for DLC, at least not in the games that I've played. Um, maybe it was like a really long DLC or something, like a Witcher. I don't know. Um, but it's separate, and it doesn't count towards the percentage of the first thing. So you can 100% the game, and then you can 100% the DLC, and then like the next DLC, and like they're all separate, and it's nice. Whereas on the Xbox side of things, when a DLC comes out, or sometimes even just an update comes out, they'll just throw more achievements in there. So if you had 100% of the game, give it a couple months, and maybe you didn't 100% it anymore, and that's super annoying. Like, wh who thought that was a good idea? Trophies are so much better in, in every single way. I, If you care about trophies or achievements, just go for the trophies, <laughs> genuinely. I, I don't even bother with achievements anymore. It's not even worth it to me. Um, and then the next feature I want to talk about is backwards compatibility. This is a really big deal for me. Right? I love that both of these systems are backwards compatible with the previous generation, almost 100%, right? I think PlayStation is missing a couple, and Xbox is missing, like, the Kinect ones, which, like, no big miss there, honestly. Let's talk, okay. But the fact that they're completely backwards compatible with the entire previous generation is fantastic. I wish that this had been the norm forever, is especially for Nintendo. Like, Nintendo will sell you the same game three generations in a row at full price. They need to start figuring out something for backwards compatibility that is better. Um, I do wish that the PlayStation side of things made it so that, like, PS3 or PS2 had some backwards compatibility, like the Xbox had done, and it seems like they're working on that. I hope that they don't put it behind the paywall of the Spartacus system that they're working on. That would really suck, but... As of right now, I think Xbox is a little bit better on the backwards compatibility side of things, but the fact that I don't have to have a PS4 or an Xbox One plugged into my TV anymore is the best thing in the world, and I'm so glad that this is the direction we're going. Um, expanded storage, right? This is something that is easier on the Xbox. You can just basically buy a memory card like it's a PS2, slop it in the back, and it's going to be perfectly fine. It's a little bit more expensive, but... If you're paying a little bit more and you're able to do it a lot easier, I think that that's worth it. On the PlayStation side of things, you have to open the entire thing up and then like find one that's specific. Like they don't make their own, so you have to go and find a specific one that's the right specs and speed and all that. So that's a huge hassle, and I'm just never going to do it. I'm never going to expand the storage on my PS5. I might get a memory card for my Xbox. I probably won't do that either, but I might actually do it on the Xbox because it's just that much easier. Um... On the Xbox side of things, you've got features like Quick Resume, which sounded like such a small thing and like kind of a gimmick at the beginning, like before I had the consoles and they were talking about it, I was like, I can't imagine that being a big deal. Let me tell you, it's a game changer. <laughs> I know that sounds stupid if you haven't played with it, but it's it's a big deal. 
being able to play a game and then have your friend be like, let's jump into a game of Fortnite or whatever. And then you go and do that and you come back and you don't have to reload the game that you were playing before. You can just go right back into it. It's so nice. And even if you're not jumping between multiple games, the fact that you can play a game and then like if you have to go somewhere, like you're going to dinner with your family or whatever, and you can come back and just jump immediately back into the game with literally no load time or any hassle whatsoever for most games. Um, that's so much better. I can't wait. Like PlayStation, I'm sure will take this feature and do their own version of it at some point, and that'll be fantastic. But right now, that's a, another win over on the Xbox side of things. And a second win in the feature department for Xbox is smart delivery. Again, before the generation started, this seemed like a gimmick. This seemed like something that wouldn't really matter. It just seemed like a word to put on a feature that would be obvious that everyone would want to do. You know, if you buy a game on your PS4 or on your Xbox One, and then you put that disc into your PS5 or Series X because it's all backwards compatible, and there is an upgraded version, it'll do it automatically. Of course it will. Like, I already bought the console, why wouldn't it do that? PlayStation? Why wouldn't it do that? Horizon Zero Dawn did it. Or, or Forbidden West is going to do it. Why didn't the rest of your games? It's like... PlayStation made this a feature that mattered by not having something similar. If both had done it, this would be a buzzword that no one would talk about. But because PlayStation made upgrading so many of their games so difficult and so irritating, now smart delivery is a thing where it's like, I'm so glad that this exists. Now let's talk about the UI real fast, right? Real fast, like I haven't talked way too much about every other section of this video so far. Um, People say that they don't like the Xbox UI, so this might be just me, but I like it a lot better than the PlayStation 1. I think it's very clearly better than the PlayStation 1. For one, it's a lot easier to get to your games library. You turn it on, the first block is the last game you played and then all the other games that you played next to it, and then one step down from that is your entire library. And you go in and it's organized really nice, it's like, here's all your games, you can look at it A to Z, here's all the games in Game Pass, here's all the games in you know, your, your games with gold catalog, right? It's just organized very nicely and very easily and separated in ways that make sense, right? Then you go over on the PlayStation th side of things and it's, it's not like that. First of all, your library is a lot harder to get to. It's all the way down to the end. You have to scroll past every other game and app that you have installed and even the ones that you don't have installed but you've played recently enough that it's still in the queue. Uh, to get to the block at the very end that has your library in it and then you get in there and it's not organized well like you go to the thing the, the list of the games that you have installed and it's not just your games it'll also have like the media player and like all the other apps in there as well and you can't separate it um there's <laughs> you'll go to like the collection tab right which should be just your games but it won't <laughs> It won't be just the games that you own digitally, like all the ones that you own on disc or that you've ever played on disc on the system will also be in there. But then you'll click on it and it'll just be like, okay, put the disc in and install it. And it's like, well, it, then it's not in my library. It's it's in the drawer. It's I it's really irritating to me um, how it's just super disorganized. And I and I know that you can like change it yourself or at least you used to be able to on ps4 i haven't seen people do it on ps5 yet where you can like make your own folder and stick your games in there and i can see that like that would be a, a way around this but you shouldn't have to take steps to work around a bad ui you know what i mean it should just be easy to use and access all your stuff in a way that makes sense immediately and, and one of the things that i see people bring up all the time about why they don't like the xbox ui or like the main menus is because it has too many ads which i don't get <laughs> because on the xbox there is on the main screen of the xbox there is one ad there's one little block that's down in the absolute bottom right like the the least important spacing <laughs> on the entire screen it's down there and it'll be like oh this new game came out maybe play that game right or whatever and then there's one next to it that i guess you could maybe view as an ad but it's usually just like there's these games in game pass now you have game pass you can play it or like here's your games for gold that you can download this month so it's not it doesn't feel as much like an ad as it feels like a reminder of things that you already own or have access to um so whatever but over on the playstation side of things the first two tabs on your menu 
are both just entirely ads. The very, the very first thing is the store. The farthest left tab is the store. When we think about like, you know, reading a book, right? Or, or like organizing things. The thing, usually the thing that's on the left is the thing that is the most important, right? It is the thing that they want you to see first. For Xbox, that first thing is the last game you played, so you can just hit A and play it. On PlayStation, it's the store, because they want your money. <laughs> and then the tab after that, I think it's called like Discovery? What is it called? The second tab? It's the Explore tab? Whatever. And that's also just like, here's a bunch of games that came out, you can play them. And guess what that is? That's an advertisement. There's two entire screens of advertisement on the PlayStation UI, and yet people are like, the Xbox One has too many ads. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Someone explain this to me. So now let's finally talk about the games. This is probably the thing that you most wanted me to talk about in this video, which is why I saved it for last, so that you would have to watch the whole video to get here. But also, there's going to be timestamps, so you could have just skipped here. And that's also fine. I'm happy to have you in whatever capacity you are willing to watch. Thank you for being here. Um, so when we're talking about the games, right, PlayStation definitely had it in the first half, right? You look at the launch lineups for the PlayStation 5 versus the Xbox Series X and S, and it is, it is about as night and day as it can be, right? PlayStation had Demon's Souls and Miles Morales and, like, Sackboy and Asteroids Playroom and a couple of other, like, scattered indies. Um, and I know that there, there are some people, myself included, who were like, oh, I'm not that excited for Demon's Souls because I played it on the PS3 and like Miles Morales is very clearly originally intended to be a DLC, but it was still really good. So like, who cares? Um, and on the Xbox side of things at launch, there was just kind of nothing. Like they were originally supposed to have Halo Infinite, but then that got delayed, which was definitely the right choice. Don't get me wrong, but that left nothing for the launch of the Xbox. There I, I, there were some indies, I think the Medium came out shortly after, and there were like some other things in there, but a lot of them were just like kind of not super exciting. I think the first thing I played on my Series X was Gears Tactics, which was new to me, because I, I didn't play it on PC where it had already been for a, a couple of months or whatever. Um, and, and that was a really good game and I really enjoyed it. Um, but having no launch games that were unique and new to that period, is a is a big miss. It's a really big miss. Um, but on the other side of that, since basically the start of 2021, PlayStation really hasn't had anything, right? Like they had Returnal, and I I understand that a lot of people really like that, but it it I hated it honestly. I thought it was really awful. Um, and then Ratchet was good, but. It relied so heavily on the gimmicks of the DualSense controller that it was just all in all a negative for me. So they were kind of like two just like speed bumps. You know, they weren't like really great, like knock it out of the park games. And I think even people who like those games will concede that like those are not the biggest games that PlayStation can put out, right? Um, and Xbox in 2021 kind of killed it, right? Like they came out with, with Psychonauts 2, which was my game of the year. They had Halo Infinite, which I didn't like as much as most people, but was, you know, it's hard to deny the numbers that it did. Same thing with uh, Forza Horizon 5, and like all of the huge games that they threw into Game Pass, like the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Like, being in the Xbox ecosystem over 2021 was just so much more exciting than being in the PlayStation ecosystem. And that's, that's a fact. Like, I don't think that there's any way to argue around that. Especially when you consider that the the best PlayStation exclusive of 2021 was Deathloop, which was made by Xbox. So like even the better parts of PlayStation's 2021 were kind of fringed by the fact that it was also like if there's a second Deathloop, it's going to be an Xbox exclusive, right? And it's 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 really weird and i concede obviously that like horizon forbidden west comes out in like three days from when i'm recording this probably two from the time it goes up and that's a big deal that's a huge game that a lot of people are really gonna love i'm really looking forward to it um i'm gonna be playing it i probably won't do a review on it because it'll be like a month late by the time i'm able to actually put it out um but you know 
so 2022 is maybe going to be a different story for PlayStation as far as this this goes, but with everything that has come out to this date, Xbox is very clearly the better games ecosystem. And, you know, that brings me to the conversation of talking about sort of my confidence in their future, right? We know that PlayStation is going to put out killer games, right? We know it. They did it most of the last generation, and they're already set to do it again this generation with, you know, Forbidden West and God of War Ragnarok is going to be huge, and like Wolverine's already announced, and Spider-Man 2, like, like, we know that there's going to be huge games on the PS on the PS5. We know it. We knew it before the PS5 was even announced, we knew that there were going to be huge games on the PS5. The difference is that unlike last generation, now we also know that there's going to be huge games on the Xbox. We know that we're going to get Starfield. We know that Elder Scrolls is going to be an, an Xbox exclusive. We know that all of these Blizzard games are going to be potentially Xbox, Xbox exclusive and like World of Warcraft might come like like there is so much potential excitement and amazing games that are coming to Xbox that we either from ones that we know about and ones that we can only begin to dream about because of how many crazy acqu acquisitions that and moves that they've made over the last 2 years that I just at this moment am f very confident that I am going to be spending four or five times more time playing games on my Xbox this generation than I am on my PlayStation. And that's coming from me who wants to play like pretty much every game that comes out because I want to be able to talk to you guys about it and because I want to experience it and like understand what these games are. So when I'm looking at, at the games lineups of these two consoles, and I do think it comes down a little bit to personal taste, whether you really like those third-person action-adventure games that PlayStation makes, or if you like any of the other genres that Xbox makes. But for me, I'm going with Xbox on this one. So I talked way longer about all of this than I than I thought I would, or that I wanted to, frankly. But to, to be fair, I had a lot to say. Um, if you made it to this point in the video, please let me know in the comments so that I know that you're one of the real ones. And, you know, I realize that this video did come down very heavily weighted in favor of the Xbox, and that's just sort of the way that I'm feeling. Um, I, I like to, you know, stay as bipartisan on all of the console wars bullshit as possible. You know, I love my PlayStation, I love my Nintendo, but... So far this generation, I think Xbox has just made a much more compelling argument. And I would love to hear how much you guys disagree with all of that in, in the comments. Please let me know, you know, how wrong I am about not liking the DualSense controller. Um, did I go too hard on that? I feel like I went really hard on this video. So let me know. And, you know, like, share, subscribe. Do all the things that all the YouTubers want you to do because it, it really does help me out a lot. And until next time, I'll see you around.